Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're finishing off with the Creation Ministries International video on radio halos and how they ruin radiometric dating. Last time they proved that radiometric dating is based on unfounded assumptions, if you ignore all the data and evidence that goes into demonstrating the validity of those assumptions. Let's see what they get into today. On this week's episode, we're talking about radio halos ruining radiometric dating. The radio halos uh, that we'll be discussing are found in granite. Oh yay, we finally get to the subject of the video. Uh, granite often has glassy pink and cream crystals, as well as flakes of a black shiny mineral called biotite. Now the biotite flakes often contain tiny crystals of other minerals, particularly zircon. The zircon crystals are typically surrounded by halos of dark, colored rings that look like little archery targets. Well, I don't know if they are typically surrounded by these rings, but they certainly can be. These are the radio halos that we've been mentioning. Okay, yeah, so how do radio halos form? Oh, easy. It's radiation damage in the crystal lattice of the rock, alpha particle decay in particular. So I'm sure you're not just going to claim that polonium's half-life is too short to cause that kind of damage, given that there are several other elements in the uranium decay chain that go through alpha decay, including uranium-238, thorium-230, radium-226, radon-222, radon-218, and a couple more. So sure, polonium's half-life is just a few minutes, so maybe it wouldn't have had enough time to damage the lattice. But the other elements in the decay chain that would cause the same damage definitely would. It's also worth noting that the person who developed the idea that you could tell what element was causing the halo based on its circumference was a creationist physicist named Robert Gentry, who consistently demonstrated a complete lack of understanding of anything to do with geology. He would regularly examine samples and draw erroneous conclusions based solely on his examination, while ignoring any data about where the sample was collected. This turns out to be a rather telling error, as geologists have been able to track down a few of his sample locations, and found them to be from uranium-rich dikes that cross-cut several layers of rock, including sedimentary rock. Why is that important? Because Gentry's claim is that any rock showing polonium halos was part of the initial creation event and must have solidified in less than three minutes, which, given that these halos were found in a rock that cross-cuts sedimentary rock and that all the sedimentary rock was laid down by the flood according to creation models, means that that particular sample would have to have been post-flood in a creation model. Now, different radioactive substances shoot alpha particles, or bullets if you like, at different though specific speeds, so we can identify the substance that's decaying from the diameter of the, of the sphere of damage. Which is Gentry's claim. It doesn't necessarily hold up to scrutiny though, as there also seems to be a general relationship between the diameter of the sphere and the age of the rock, which was actually tried out as a dating method for a while, but it turns out to not be useful, as the size of the sphere is also related to the amount of radioactive material and what physical structure the crystal lattice took, so there are a lot of variables that are a lot harder to account for than with the other dating methods. The higher the energy of decay, the faster the speed of the bullet. That's right. Radioactive uranium generates a stunning multi-ringed halo because it decays in a number of steps. There are 15 isotopes, or varieties of elements, in this decay chain. Yep, and there you can see at the bottom they are using Gentry's data to draw these conclusions. Gentry's data that is known to be faulty because of his complete disregard for reporting on the geological setting in which his samples were found. Here you can see radioactive decay series beginning with uranium-238 and ending with lead-206. Eight of those emit alpha particles when they decay, forming eight rings. Now, if instead of radioactive uranium, the core was composed of an isotope along the chain somewhere, there would be fewer rings produced. So it's quite simple to work out which isotope was originally in the core by counting the rings. Except that it has not been well established that the number of rings actually does correspond to the starting element. That is one of Gentry's assertions that has failed to be evidentially verified. Uh, for example, polonium-218 forms three rings, polonium-214 forms two, and polonium-210 forms only one. All right. At today's measured rates of radioactive decay, it's been estimated that uranium would have to decay for 100 million years to produce the uranium halos. Ooh. 
Fun fact, if you want to use Gentry's model, the decay rates for all of the elements except for polonium would have had to have changed. And since nuclear decay rates are one of the things keeping the core of the Earth hot, the faster decay rates correspond to more energy and higher temperatures. If the decay rates of all the elements were increased 6 to 10,000 years ago by enough to have them reading the ages that we see now, the resultant release of energy would have kept the Earth molten today. On top of that, if Gentry is right about the changing decay rates, then that means that his model of the different rings of the halos corresponding to the different elements cannot be correct, even if polonium stayed constant through the whole thing. So, ironically, to come to the conclusion that these rings all represent specific elements, you need to first assume constant decay rates. As soon as you start messing with the decay rates, the rest of the model goes out the window, making this whole argument self-defeating. That is, at today's decay rates. At today's rates, yeah. Now, here's where things get interesting. Alongside the uranium halos within granites, there is powerful evidence that uranium once decayed much faster during a global geological catastrophe. Which would then render all of Gentry's models completely useless. Faster decay means higher energy particles, which would mess with how far the alpha particles would penetrate the rock. Let's see that evidence. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, the, the last three rings of a uranium halo are produced by an element called polonium, as we just said. Madame Curie, with her husband Pierre, discovered it in 1898 and named it after her homeland, Poland. A uh, little rabbit trail there. Uh, one of the more interesting features of radioactive polonium is that it decays very quickly. It turns into something else very, very fast. Because of that, it's rarely found in nature by itself. It's continually generated when uranium decays, it's part of that decay sequence. Yeah, that's accurate enough for me. So radioactive polonium is always associated with uranium. Well, radium and thorium also have long enough half-lives that they could be incorporated into the rock and then decay into polonium, but I don't think that's particularly important. So it was a great surprise when researchers discovered radio halos that were produced by polonium alone. Yes. Here are some pictures of polonium radio halos without uranium. The big question is, how did polonium come to exist on its own in the radio centers of these halos? Maybe contamination by radium or thorium that then decayed into polonium? That question puzzled scientists for many years. Yeah, but how do we know that they really are polonium halos? Uh, and, and the answer is, polonium halos are easily identified by the number of rings and the size of those rings. That's been confirmed by experiments. Yes, Gentry performed experiments with ionizing radiation on rock samples that did produce similar discolorations. But he was unable to reproduce the actual ring pattern in his experiment. So at the end of the day, his experiment verified that ionizing radiation can indeed cause damage like that in rocks. And that's it. It didn't verify anything about which elements would have produced rings of which diameters. There had to be a source of abundant polonium close by to create the radio centers. Otherwise, the polonium halos would not have formed. Right. Many of the polonium halos have uranium halos right next to them, often less than a millimeter away. There's a hint. Here's a picture with the polonium-214 radio halo with the faint outer ring. Uh, it's the one that's centered on the crack that you can see in the crystal there, and a dark uranium radio halo nearby. That's the larger dark area below and to the left that you see there. Another fun fact, one of Gentry's claims that his polonium halo model relies on is the idea that polonium halos are usually found where there are no cracks, fractures, or microfractures through which radon could contaminate the rock. But you must have missed that part, or you wouldn't have shown the image of a polonium halo on the crack. But that's a moot point anyway, because the rocks with the most abundant polonium halos are the rocks that are known to form crystals quickly, possibly in a matter of hours, like calcite vein dikes, which is one of the types of rocks that Gentry used for his observations. To make the polonium halos requires an abundant supply of polonium. It takes the amount equivalent to about 100 million years of radioactive decay of uranium at today's rates. So by looking at the rings, the halos, and the amounts of parent and daughter isotopes, there's been the equivalent of about 100 million years of radioactive decay at the, at the rates we measure today. And that's an issue because, what, the polonium had a short half-life, so its presence without a uranium halo is somehow problematic? Well, 
Thing is, polonium halos are only ever found near uranium halos, indicating that the polonium that made the halos had its origin in the decay chain of uranium. And there is always something there that would allow for the transport of the atoms that would be responsible for the polonium halos to the new location. Whether that be microfractures or large fractures filled in by calcite, they are never found by themselves. So even if I grant you everything that you've said up to this point, I find it more plausible to believe that something moved through these channels that we can see than to think that all of modern geology must be wrong because of this one not quite perfectly explained phenomenon. But, but all of this polonium had to be available quickly before it could decay away. Right. That is, it all had to concentrate within hours or a few days at the most. Yes, and given the fact that calcite vein dikes could have started to crystallize that quickly, I fail to see the problem here. Therefore, the polonium halos mean that 100 million years worth of radioactive decay of uranium at the decay rates measured today occurred in just a few days. One of the ways polonium halos formed was from the uranium decaying into radon gas, which then traveled through microfractures before decaying into polonium. Uranium-bearing minerals provide an ample supply of radon gas for these purposes. There's a reason it's recommended you get your home checked for radon gas every now and again. That stuff is abundant, and it decays into polonium. Interestingly, if Gentry's model were correct, we would expect to see three independent types of polonium halos, but we only ever see the one. The one that we see is the one whose half-life is measured in minutes, as opposed to seconds or microseconds. In other words, the radioactive decay of uranium was formerly up to a billion times faster than it is today. But the decay rate of polonium stayed the same, because reasons. Like, seriously, just look at your own argument. You are saying that because polonium's half-life is so short, it must have been in abundant supply all at the same time in order to produce the halos that we see. You then conclude from this argument that uranium's half-life was a billion times faster than it is today. Your evidence for this is found as a result of polonium's perfectly stable decay rate. Because if you are right and the decay rates are variable, then obviously polonium decayed slower in the past than today, so it was able to stick around long enough to accumulate to make the halos. So we still have old ages being the most parsimonious conclusion, even if we throw out all of radiometric dating because of all the other lines of evidence that we have for the age of the Earth and universe. Wow. Accelerated nuclear decay. That would explain why, of all the methods to age date various parts of creation, the oceans, the atmosphere, rocks, trees, whatever, this particular method which is based on nuclear decay, radioactive decay, gives dates that are way higher than most of the other methods. Right. Let's just pretend that you're right. All of radiometric dating has to be thrown out the window because of this polonium phenomenon. So we're just left with dendrochronology giving us an unbroken timeline going back more than 11,000 years. We're left with the visual stratigraphy of ice cores going back about 100,000 years. We're left with starlight that has been in transit for 13 billion years to get to the Earth. We still have the Big Bang, the model of how the universe formed that has made testable predictions that just wouldn't have been true in a young Earth, like the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation, redshifted to the microwave spectrum just as predicted. That's it for today, they just give a quick recap of their main points. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Nikki2, who says, Animals have been charged with crimes in the past by the Christian church and others like the ancient Greeks. Why yes, yes they have. In fact, this reminds me of the cockchafer, which is a bug that was sentenced to exile and given three days to comply, with the penalty for non-compliance being death. That was in the 1300s. Mostly, I just wanted to say cockchafer. Also, they're friggin' adorable. Thanks for watching, extra special thanks this week to Lynn Dobbs, who purchased a webcam, and John, who purchased a portable monitor for working on the go, both items from my Amazon wishlist. Since I have the webcam now, I guess I have no excuse. Um, I'll be doing a face reveal to celebrate when I get to 60,000 subscribers. So if you're watching this, but you aren't subscribed, consider giving that button a tap if you want to see what my ugly mug looks like. Special thanks as always to my patron, especially David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, and What Jesus, who are the radiation that damages the crystal lattice that is my channel. If you'd like to give me a halo, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!